Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello friends, in the previous class we looked at vocabulary strategies. Continuing our discussion about effective writing, today we will look at modifiers and also hedging devices. To start with, let us look at modifiers. So, modifiers is you know is a um, is a term it is applied to a word or a phrase which actually as the name says it modifies you know uh, the sentence meaning um, as a whole or it may you know modify only one part of it. So, as you can see here uh, this group includes adverbs, adjectives or other phrases you know with similar functions. These modifiers are you know very important in academic context. They are you know basically used in two um, contexts. So, what are they? Let us look at them. First one to provide more detail you know usually with verbs um, and or adjectives. Let us look at the examples. Reasonably good data is available for only. So, these are all sentences uh, taken from academic uh, writing samples. So, you can see here this is the modifier reasonably good data is available. Decomposition eventually ceases in modern landfill. So, eventually here is a modifier. The second context sometimes you find them you know at the beginning of sentences where they introduce new points or new perspectives. So, let us look at the examples. Currently, the earth's atmosphere appears to be. So, here the word currently is modifier. Probably you have uh, talked about something you know in the past and you are now moving to the present and this modifier indicates that shift. Look at the second example. Alternatively, the use of non-conventional renewable energies. So, here the modifier is alternatively. So, probably you have talked about conventional renew, you know, energy resources or some other kind of thing. Now, you want to uh, you know, focus on something else. So, you are introducing an option here. So, that is indicated uh, by this modifier alternatively. So, adverbs particularly you know adverbs which are linked to verbs and adjectives you can group them into three categories. So, first one you know related to time. So, these adverbs they give some import some information about you know when something happened. So, look at examples previously published. So, here previously is um, the modifier retrospectively examined retrospectively here is the modifier. So, both these they they are related to time. So, they tell something about the time. Second is degree, in other words they answer the question how much. So, for example, declined considerably. So, if you say declined, so by what percentage, to what extent. So, then you use considerably. So, this is the modifier. Then contribute substantially. So, this tells about the degree of contribution. So, substantially here is the modifier. The third category is you know uh, modifiers which you know give information about the manner in which something is done. 
So, they answer the question in what way? Look at the examples medically complicated. So, if you say something is complicated, so how? So, medically here is the modifier. Remotely located, so remotely you know is the manner uh, adverb here. So, uh, we have seen that they can significantly change the meaning, they bring in new perspectives, these modifiers and in particular adverbs. So, therefore, we need to use them with utmost care. So, you know uh, it is dangerous to overuse these and um, as you can see here you know the examples some you may not want to use in academic context. For example, fortunately, remarkably, so uh, you know some words which you, you know indicate that it was not in your hand something like fortunately, unfortunately. So, we do not use them in say a research paper. Similarly, um, uh, an adverb like remarkably which actually exaggerates something. So, these also we do not um, use. And then you know you also need to pay attention to the position of the adverb in the sentence where exactly you are using. So, the rule of thumb is you know uh, you, you need to place the modifier immediately next to a phrase or a word you want to modify. If you change the position, the meaning actually may change. So, the questions you need to ask are here. So, is it close to the word it is modifying? Is it breaking up other important parts of the sentence? So, if you know in some uh, cases you should not break up a phrase, then the sentence is ungrammatical. So, you need to keep in mind two things. So, one am I placing the modifier um, immediately next to that part which I want to modify? Second question, so um, am I you know uh, breaking up any phrase and thereby making the sentence ungrammatical. So, keeping these two things you need to place the modifier in a sentence. Then there are some modifiers you know they are called limiting modifiers. Uh, examples are only, almost, hardly, just, scarcely, merely, simply, exactly, even. So, these modifiers they are very important. The meaning of the sentence can change dramatically depending on where you put these in a sentence. So, we will look at an example uh, to illustrate this point. Okay. So, here the sentence is John met Mary in the train yesterday. Now, the adverb the modifier I have chosen is only. So, you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 sentences here. The only difference among these is where this modifier only is placed. So, let us look at these sentences in detail. Sentence 1, only John met Mary in the train yesterday. John only met Mary in the train yesterday. John met only Mary in the train yesterday. John met Mary only in the train yesterday. John met Mary in the only train yesterday. John met Mary in the train only yesterday. John met Mary in the train yesterday only. So, if you look at this, now you might have already realized that there is um, a dramatic difference in the interpretation. So, first one only John met Mary in the train yesterday. So, here only modifies John. So, here you are trying to say, so nobody else met Mary, only John met Mary in the train yesterday. When you say like this, John only met Mary in the train yesterday, you are here confirming, yes, John did meet Mary in the train 
yesterday. John met only Mary in the train yesterday. So, here it is modifying Mary. So, John did not meet somebody else. So, he met only one person and that was um, Mary. John met Mary only in the train yesterday. So, here you know uh, this is again you are saying John met only Mary. Then look at this sentence John met Mary in the only train yesterday. Here only is modifying train. So, um, there was only one train. So, that is what you are referring to here. John met Mary in the train only yesterday. So, this is modifying here yesterday it is talking. So, it has not been quite long time. So, they met only yesterday. John met Mary in the train yesterday only. So, it means you know did not wait for today uh, something that kind of meaning he was in a hurry. So, he met her yesterday only. So, as you can see here by just changing the location of the modifier only you can you know um, see the shift in the interpretation. So, the sentential meaning um, varies. So, you need to be very careful where you place um, modifiers in the sentence. Now, let us do a small uh, exercise. So, insert a suitable adverb um, in the uh, blanks here. So, let us look at these sentences blank the mobile phones were bulky and highly expensive. So, what is the clue here were past tense. So, you need something you know which refers to time in the past. So, one option here is you can use initially. So, initially the mobile phones were bulky and highly expensive. Look at the second one the quickest way is to take the train blank you can take the motorway if you want to enjoy the scenario around. So, look at the context there is a clue there. So, you are talking about train and motorway. So, there are two options to get to some place. So, you can use the adverb alternatively. So, the quickest way is to take the train alternatively you can take the motorway if you want to enjoy the scenario around. Look at number 3 the concern about financing the health service has been growing. So, here the clue is this present perfect continuous. So, this you know it means uh, something has started in the recent past and it is continuing and it is likely to continue in the near future as well. So, it focuses on the duration you know the length of the process. So, you can use an adverb like gradually or something like steadily. Uh, you know which focuses on you know uh, the length of um, this process the duration of this uh, particular event. Now, um, let us look at this table this gives some you know uh, adverbs which you can use um, uh, to describe changes in the rate of something. So, if it is small you can say gradually, slightly, marginally, slowly. If it is um, large change, so you can say enormously, sharply, dramatically, rapidly. If it is somewhere in between you can say substantially, significantly, steadily, considerably. Um, now, keep this list in mind we will now try an exercise. 
So, in these sentences, you need to read them very carefully and then supply an adverb. So, let us look at these one by one. Last year, inflation increased blank from 2 to 2.1 percent. So, this is the change. So, 2 to 2.1 percent. So, you may think it is not very significant. So, this is a very small change. So, go back to our list. So, we can use something from this. So, here you can pick either this or this. So, we can say marginally. Last year inflation increased marginally from 2 to 2.1 percent. Look at the second one. The crude oil prices have fallen blank in the last 20 months by about 35 percent. So, this you think is huge, this is very significant. So, you can go back to the table. So, you can look at this column here. So, you can choose something from here. So, say you can choose this. So, say the crude oil prices have fallen sharply in the last 20 months by about 35 percent. Look at number 3, sales rose blank while he was chairman averaging 14 percent per year. So, here again 14 percent per year you think this is very huge, very significant. So, you can use something like dramatically here. So, you can say sales rose dramatically while he was chairman averaging 14 percent per year. So, now you can see that when you supply a modifier, it refines your sentence. So, these you know make your writings more attractive and you will be able to convey your thoughts in a better way. But of course, you have to be very careful with the use of modifiers. There are um, some issues, you know, some problems um, you know, and some common mistakes learners do regarding the use of modifiers. So, we will look at them now. The first one is misplaced modifiers. So, as the name suggest you have used a modifier in the wrong place. So, you wanted to modify something, but you have placed it um, somewhere else. Now, it is modifying something else and as a result the meaning it is conveying is very different or sometimes absurd. Okay. Look at the example here. It was not a good idea to serve food to the guests standing around the room on flimsy paper plates. So, look at this. So, this is a modifier here, but you have placed it next to this. So, now what is the meaning you get? guests were standing around the room on flimsy paper plates, which is actually very funny. But you actually wanted to say food was served on flimsy paper plates. So, the modifier here has been misplaced. So, now the solution is take it and place it immediately next to what you wanted to modify. So, now you say it was not a good idea to serve food on flimsy paper plates to the guests standing around the room. So, that is how you uh, know correct uh, mistakes with misplaced modifiers. The second issue is what we call dangling modifiers. So, 
This appears in a sentence that contains no word or phrase to which the modifier can be reasonably linked. So, you have used it, but what it is modifying that is the modified part is not explicit. Look at example, heading up to the mountains for the weekend, the road was covered in a thick layer of ice. So, this is the main part, this is the modifier heading up to the mountains for the weekend. Um, but who is heading up the mountains? Now, it looks like as if the road was headed up the mountains, but this is not what you meant, right? You meant, uh, you know, somebody there, say uh, I or we. So, you need, uh, you know, a, a subject there. So, you can say heading up to the mountains for the weekend, we saw that the road was covered in a thick layer of ice. So, um, this what we call you know is dangling modifiers. You have the modifier here, but the modified part is missing. So, you add something like then the sentence actually now is more appropriate. The next issue is what we call disruptive modifiers. So, they separate closely collected elements in a sentence, making the sentence difficult to read and understand. So, um, we observed earlier that you should not break up a sentence um, by placing a modifier in between and sometimes it makes the sentence ungrammatical as well. Look at the example. The researcher, because he had never worked with chimpanzees before and was therefore unaware of their intelligence, was surprised when they purposely undermined the experiment he was trying to conduct. So, this part is modifier. So, a small one, one adverb probably uh, may look uh, okay, but this is a very longish um, clause and um, this is modifying the researcher, but this interrupts the flow here. So, you want to say the researcher was surprised when the chimpanzees purposefully undermined the experiment he was trying to conduct. So, this is the main idea, but this modifier here interrupts the flow of reading. So, maybe one way is you take it this entire part and place it in the very beginning and then the flow continues. The next issue is squinting modifiers. So, squinting modifiers means you have a modifier there, but um, it leads to an ambiguous interpretation because it can modify more than one element in the sentence. So, uh, it can refer to either the word before it or the one which comes after it. So, thereby leading to at least two very different meanings. Look at this example. People who enjoy listening to MJ often claim that he was the finest American performer of the 20th century. Here, the modifier is often, but the problem here is this modifies two things. Listening to MJ, this is one part and claiming, second part. So, now the question is, are you trying to say that people listen to MJ often or people claim often? So, there are two possibilities here. So, that is what I'm, I have listed here. The people in question listen to the music often or they often claim something about uh, MJ. So, here this is a case of squinting modifiers. So, 
in order to remove ambiguity you need to change the position of this. So, you can simply move it here people who um, you know often enjoy listening to MJ claim that he was the finest American performer or you simply say that people who enjoy listening to MJ claim often that he was the finest American performer of the 20th century. So, by changing its position you can you know disambiguate this sen sentence. The next aspect is what we call hedging devices. So, what are they? So, what is its importance in academic uh, writing? So, let us look at it. So, um, hedging you know is an important uh, feature of academic writing. So, to put it in simple words, so hedging means being bit cautious about what you are saying. So, you know modifying the claims you are making, the general statements you are making. Um, why? You know you need to uh, d distinguish between facts and claims. So, facts are you know, accepted by everyone fine say uh, on the basis of that you are making a claim. So, uh, how sure you are about this? So, how strong is your claim? So, um, hedging actually can help you in that. So, why do we need to uh, you know use hedging devices and in academic context and how we go about it. So, let us look at it in detail. So, uh, to begin with hedging can be defined as the use of linguistic devices to show hesitation or uncertainty and to display politeness and indirectness. So, you use many linguistic devices. So, um, these linguistic devices could be a single word or a phrase, it could be a verb, an adverb, a noun, um, but the purpose here is see you want to uh, you know be polite and you also do not want to make a very bold claim, you want to be cautious. So, now you might think ok in academic context I have done research. So, following all the protocols you know all the conventions in my field of study. So, uh, it has been a quite rigorous uh, experiment. So, I have got now the results. So, then why do I need to be cautious about the claims I make? Uh, why do I need to be polite about what I am saying? So, why cannot I say something with full force? So, this you know is a common question many people you know uh, ask themselves, but uh, you need to note here that no matter how rigorously you know you have followed all the conventions and everything there is always you know a scope for improvement. Unless you have something you know um, just universally accepted and remember many of the things which we now take uh, take for granted earlier started as claims and then several studies over a number of years have established those claims as facts. Something simple as you know the earth revolving around the sun it again took lot of studies many scientists um, you know uh, conducted many experiments and then now we accept it as a fact. So, the study you have conducted and the claim you are making on the basis of it remember is just only the beginning. So, um, there are possi many possibilities one you may have made a mistake unknowingly and somebody else points it out 
So, if you have a strong claim immediately that, that just you know gets uh, uh, demolished. Second, you know you never know that later on um, something you know might come up an evidence which contradicts your findings. So, you cannot be 100 percent sure about the validity of your experiment and results. So, therefore, uh, whatever you say you turn it down. You say yes, it, it my I have conducted my research study uh, in a thorough manner, but still you know I am making this claim say with 90 percent uh, certainty. So, there is always you know scope for error some issues there. So, that is how you know um, we need uh, that you know that is why we need these um, hedging uh, devices. Let us now look at some examples. So, here are um, some sentences uh, taken from articles. Let us look at these primary products usually have low supply and demand elasticities. So, here uh, this is the hedging device multiple factors may lead to a psychiatric consultation may is the hedging device. Some parameters might depend on the degree of water content in the sand might is the hedging device. Women tend to value privacy more than men tend, tend to you know is the hedging device. Other studies suggest that some permanent shift will occur suggest and will both these are hedging devices. Now, let us look at these contexts and see what difference they have brought in. So, looking at the first sentence, if you simply say primary products have low supply and demand elasticities, this is a strong claim. So, it is applicable um, in all circumstances, but you do not want to make such a broad claim, very general claim, because it is easy for others to you know point out. Um, some data, some evidence which contradicts this. So, it is better you use a hedging device here usually. So, you say maybe ok 90 to 95 percent this is the thing, but see I am you know um, acknowledging that 5 percent there may be error, may be some other kind of situation. Look at the second one multiple factors may lead to a psychiatric consultation. So, if you um, do not use hedging device and if you simply say multiple factors lead to a psychiatric consultation. So, this is again you are saying with 100 percent certainty, but it may not be the case particularly you know in humanities um, and social sciences we know it is uh, not easy to make such highly generalizable claims. So, the writer here has used the model verb may. Similarly, the second one see some parameters might depend might here is the model verb and it is the hedging device. Instead of saying some parameters depend on the degree of water content in the sand, you say might depend. So, that tones down. Look at next one, women tend to value privacy more than men. So, you have used um, verb here um, and see what the difference it has brought in. So, if you say women value privacy more than men, this is quite a strong claim, but if you say tend to value privacy, so you are kind of you know softening. Look at the last one, other studies suggest that some permanent shift will occur. So, here the verb suggest is a hedging device. So, how you can compare you know this verb 
with other verbs like for example, prove or establish. So, these indicate higher level of certainty, suggest is actually you know you are being a bit cautious. Some permanent shift will occur, this will is again you know, model verb, this is a hedging device. So, some permanent shift occurs, so if you use a simple present tense, you are being very sure. So, probably you mean to say that that is a general tendency, but you do not want to do so. So, you will use the model verb uh, will here. So, as I said, you know it is necessary to make decisions about the stance on a particular subject or the strength of the claims you are making. So, accordingly you will use a hedging device and tone it down, but with facts we do not say for example, we do not say the earth seems to be revolving around the sun. So, we do not say that, we simply say the earth revolves around the sun. So, because that is fact or we say India got independence on August 15, 1947. So, this is again a fact. So, these are well established and universally accepted, but if you are making a claim based on some data, then you need to decide uh, you know how strong your claim is going to be. So, as I mentioned earlier, um, you know most of all the claims you make in academic writing are debatable and therefore, um, academic writers they express their ideas with medium level of certainty. So, they do not claim that whatever they are saying is absolutely true. So, you will need a lot of evidence, lot of studies um, to say that something is absolutely true. Say for example, um, how dinosaurs vanished. So, there is a theory that an asteroid hit the earth and uh, that uh, you know led to series of uh, catastrophic uh, changes in the environment, in the surroundings and um, all those things eventually led to the, the complete extinction of dinosaurs. But can somebody say that this is absolutely true? So, there is evidence about this theory fine, but is it established beyond doubt? No. So, um, you express something only with medium level certainty until you know uh, you have lot of evidence, a uh, lot of uh, people um, saying the same thing and then it gets accepted. So, um, in academic context, people use hedging devices for several different purposes. So, they are listed here. So, one to minimize the possibility of um, you know you appear uh, opposing and demolishing your arguments in you know um, in a very uh, uh, simple manner. Um, it means if you make something you know uh, some claim uh, with very high level of certainty, then it becomes easier for people to question it. Um, you know it might be your um, teacher, your colleague, maybe student, uh, somebody else working in the same field. So, um, they will be able to criticize you, they will be able to point out loopholes in your argument uh, if you make very strong claims. Second, to enable you as a writer to be more precise when reporting results. See, uh, you can uh, say that something is not proven 100 percent, but you know that is what it is indicated and subsequently you know it is assumed. 
So, you do not say that this is 100 percent. So, this is what you know it seems to indicate and this is what we can assume. So, that is the um, kind of uh, you know level you, you know you will be making uh, claims about your uh, uh, results. Next, to enable you to execute a politeness strategy in which you are able to acknowledge that perhaps there may be flaws in your claims. So, this is very important. So, this I uh, have already mentioned. Uh, you may have uh, you know controlled all the uh, variables and um, you may have uh, you know followed all the conventions, but uh, uh, there is always some scope for errors. So, you acknowledge that yes, at least you know maybe 5 percent there is chance factor, 5 percent uh, there is possibility of some error. So, whatever I am saying is um, you know is true in 95 percent of cases. So, that is what you want to uh, say, you acknowledge that there may be flaws. So, uh, by doing so, you are being uh, polite uh, in uh, academic context. Next, to conform to a now accepted practice writing style. So, um, this has now become almost a norm. So, um, you know uh, journals and um, many other um, academic platforms, they expect you to um, use these hedging devices, they expect you to be polite, be cautious about what you are saying. So, if you make uh, very uh, strong claims, probably your paper may not get accepted. Um, it, it will undergo more rigorous review and so, even if this say 1 percent issue, then um, your paper will be uh, rejected if you have a uh, very strong claims. Instead, if you are cautious about what you are saying, so then people you know accept ok. So, this person has done rigorous research, but of course, there is always a scope for improvement, there is always a scope for error. So, that can be you know uh, overlooked, but if it is a strong claim, then things get complicated. So, this is now you know, you know an accepted practice. So, um, what are the different ways to hedge? So, we have seen examples that you can use model verbs, you can use verbs. Let us look at some more uh, possibilities. So, one is you use model verbs such as may, might, uh, can and so on. You use um, you know nouns which are called model nouns for example, probability, assumption. So, there is probability that something. So, these function um, similar to this model verbs. Then, you have lexical verbs which denote a sense of caution. For example, assume, indicate, um, suggest. So, these you know kind of indicate some kind of caution using expressions which show a sense of caution or vagueness. Uh, for example, it can be argued that, so look at this phrase. So, you do not simply say this is true, you can say that it can be argued that, it is likely to be the case that. So, likely to be, um, so these are all you know very clearly. Um, uh, are hedging devices and they show a sense of caution or vagueness. So, for example, you know if you say that attendance should be compulsory. So, this is a very strong statement, but if we say it can be argued that attendance be uh, made compulsory, then you are being cautious. Okay. Now, let us do an exercise. Here are some um, sentences, some extracts from uh, academic writing. Um, let us look at these and then see if uh, a hedging device has been used 
or not. Look at the first one viewing a movie in which alcohol is portrayed appears to lead to higher total alcohol consumption uh, of young people while watching the movie. So, here you are making something about you know um, watching alcohol consumption in a movie and how it affects young people's consumption. So, is there a hedging device here? So, yes. So, the author here has used um, a lexical verb. Uh, the verb appears here kind of you know indicates that the author is cautious. So, you compare it with its version without this verb. So, if you remove this now see viewing the movie in which alcohol is portrayed um, leads to higher total alcohol consumption of young people while watching the movie. So, this is a very strong statement. So, you do not want to you know make such a strong claim. So, you bring in a lexical um, verb appears and so you have hedged it. Look at the second example. Furthermore, this proves that humans are wired to imitate. So, is there a hedging device here? Um, so, author has you know probably given some example there is some evidence there and then on the basis of that the claim is that humans are wired to imitate. Uh, the word which you need to focus on is this proves. So, what does prove mean? So, prove is you know um, uh, very high level of certainty. So, for example, we use it you know in legal um, cases. So, this proves that so x is the culprit. So, it is a very high level of certainty. Um, so, uh, it is better to replace this word. So, what can we use in um, its place? You can say furthermore this you can use indicates or suggests or you can say shows and you can also insert something here. Say for example, you can say humans are probably wired to imitate. So, now you can see that uh, you are toning down, you are being little more cautious about what you are saying. Let us look at one more example. It is unquestionable that our survey proved that the portrayal of alcohol and drinking characters in movies directly leads to more alcohol consumption in young adult male viewers when alcohol is available within the situation. So, this is again talking about two things portrayal of alcohol and drinking characters in movies and alcohol consumption in young adult male when alcohol is you know within the reach. Um, so, has hedging uh, you know been done here? Um, it seems it has not been. Look at uh, this, it is unquestionable. This is a very strong word and you have also used the word proved. So, usually we do not use such words in academic writing. So, you simply say that, so all this part you can delete, you can say our survey. So, we have discussed, so prove is a strong word, replace it. So, our survey um, showed that um, 
portrayal of alcohol and drinking characters in movies. So, directly leads you can replace this with. So, may directly lead. So, if you say directly leads it means you know 100 percent this is going to happen, but if you say may directly lead. So, this is a possibility. So, remember this is about human behavior and uh, you cannot be so sure about it. So, being cautious uh, actually helps. So, you use a hedging device to be more cautious. Now, let us do um, another exercise. Here are some sentences and these do not have any hedging devices. So, let us read these and insert a hedging device to tone down the claims. The data proves that students learn better when taught in mother tongue. So, problem here is prove. So, change it. So, you can say the data suggests that students may learn better when taught in mother tongue or you can say students um, tend to learn better. So, you are being cautious here. This is about you know uh, what you are making claim on the basis of data. There is no previous study in this area at all. Say you have done a review of previous research you are trying to you know justify your study. So, uh, it may be true that uh, there has not been any study, but um, it is possible that there was some study in some part of the world, but you have not found it. Uh, uh, so, you cannot be so sure that this th there has not been anything in this uh, area of study. So, you have to be cautious. So, instead of saying there is no previous study in this area at all, you know you can say there seems to be no previous study in this area and this is a strong one delete it or you be little more specific. So, you break it into uh, you know further you know area and say in this part this part has not been studied. So, uh, there are studies which have considered uh, this part of the problem, but this part has not been looked at or this part has been looked at from one particular perspective, uh, but not from this perspective. So, you be little more specific and um, you avoid making such um, very strong claims. Look at the uh, third one. The survey results must be used to improve user interface in smartphones. So, you have conducted a survey and on the basis of that you are arguing about improving user interface in smartphones. So, um, what is the issue here? issue is with your model verb must. So, this is you know very high level of certainty, this is a kind of you know um, you are making it compulsory, but um, that does not work. So, uh, we know there may be issues with this and um, even if you say hypothetically uh, it was foolproof you cannot make it mandatory for others. So, there is a problem here. So, change the model verb. You can say the survey results may be used or can be used um, to improve user interface in smartphones. So, now you are being um, little more cautious and uh, so, then it is uh, acceptable and it is more appropriate. 
So, um, that is how you know you use hedging devices in academic context. So, summing up today we looked at two important aspects which make your writing effective. One the use of modifiers and second use of hedging devices. So, modifiers we saw that you know uh, they traditionally include adverbs and adjectives, but it would also be a phrase or a clause which is modifying another part of that sentence. So, if you use these modifiers very carefully, your writing becomes more you know effective, you will be able to convey your ideas in a better way. We saw that there are um, some common mistakes uh, many people make regarding the use of uh, modifiers like misplacing them. So, you need to place it um, next to the part which you want to modify and then sometimes you have a disrupting modifier, uh, you have a long piece of uh, text, a uh, phrase or a clause. So, you have placed in between uh, the sentence and as a result it disrupts the natural flow. So, avoid um, such um, usage and then we uh, looked at dangling modifiers means you have used a modifier, but what it is modifying is not explicit. So, you have to make it explicit in your sentence. Then squinting modifiers, so you have some modifiers, uh, but they are placed in such a way that they can modify more than one element in the sentence thereby leading to you know uh, ambiguity. So, place it appropriately and avoid uh, you know ambiguity. We also you know saw that there is a group of uh, modifiers which are called limiting modifiers like only, scarcely. So, these you have to use with great caution. So, the meaning might dramatically change depending on where you place it in the sentence. The next part was about hedging devices. So, we saw that in academic context people need to be cautious about the claims they are making. You cannot make a claim with 100 percent surety, 100 percent certainty. So, we use various linguistic devices such as model verbs, model nouns, um, then some phrases to you know tone down what we are saying. So, these are very crucial. One, if you make a strong claim, remember it is very easy to um, uh, you know point out problems with it and demolish your argument and then you want to be sure about your results. Uh, so, no research is foolproof. So, you want to be cautious then it is also now an accepted practice to use uh, hedging devices and be polite and indirect. So, you use them in your writing and your writing um, style um, improves, your readers will appreciate your style. Thank you.